Okay, so welcome to lesson nine, where we start to look at photosynthesis and how it compares and contrasts and connects to that cellular respiration process that we spent the last few days looking at. And it's quite important to think of it in the context of cellular respiration and photosynthesis working together, because ultimately, when you think about the idea of photosynthesis and the idea of respiration, you'll start to see some parallels here. So sunlight energy is transferred into chemical energy in photosynthesis. So we're taking carbon dioxide, water, and we're using energy from the sun to produce sugar and oxygen. So you, you can really start to see some of those parallels to aerobic respiration when we compare and contrast it. Photoautotrophs are organisms that take that light energy and they create chemical energy as a result of it. They form those complex organic molecules from simple inorganic raw materials. So an example of that are any type of protist, any type of bacteria, and the most important one for us, well, maybe not necessarily the most important one for us, but one of the most important ones for us are plants. It's incredibly important to recognize the context with which matter and energy particles uh, are cycled through producers and consumers, as well as decomposers. When you think about producers of plants, consumers like us and any other animal, and decomposers like fungi and some bacteria, uh, we have to think of it in the context of that second law of thermodynamics again, right? Some useful energy is always going to be lost in each stage of the cycle. Therefore, there must be a continuous input of energy from the sun for life to continue on earth. Without it, all life would cease to exist. It is physically impossible for life on this planet to exist without that energy input from the sun. So food production as well as oxygen need to be um, utilized, produced, consumed, and it all starts with the sun. So when we think about how it starts with the sun, we need to think about how that energy is harnessed. And in order to do that, we have to look at the stages of photosynthesis. So we're going to look at photosynthesis in, in explicit detail here. It's, it's quite a bit of material, uh, similar to the complexity of aerobic respiration. And I really want you to think about the context of, of similarities between aerobic respiration as well as um, photosynthesis. Because in my tiny little diagram off to the right, in a plant cell, I look at the combination of photosynthesis as well as aerobic respiration happening in conjunction. But before I get into that, let's take a look at the stages of photosynthesis. There are two stages of photosynthesis, the light dependent reactions and the light independent reactions. So light dependent reactions are gonna absorb that sunlight. They're gonna take that sun energy and they're gonna harness it and utilize it to create those sugars. The light independent reactions, the Calvin cycle is a component of it, and we'll talk about that as we move forward, but this is going to make the actual sugars. It doesn't need that sunlight because the light dependent reactions have already harnessed that sunlight energy for utilization. But now when we look at things like the Calvin cycle, it's going to not need light in order to make those sugars. So where does this all happen in a plant? The only difference between plant cell, oh, sorry, the one major difference between plant cells and animal cells is the fact that they have a chloroplast. Now, regardless of where you learned that information, you know that it is the one big main difference that separates plant organelles from animal organelles. So when you think about the membrane bound organelle that is responsible for photosynthesis, you should think about the chloroplast. It is utilized in all photosynthetic eukaryotes. It has a structure that kind of looks like a stack of coins, for lack of a better word, encased by a membrane. So there's an outer and inner membrane, just like in the mitochondria. It has what's called a stroma, which allows for, I'll just get the rest of these notes cleared out for you all. It has a stroma, which allows for the aqueous environment inside the inner membrane uh, that surrounds the thylakoids. And those thylakoids are gonna be respond those coin stacks, if you will. So that stroma is that liquid that surrounds those thylakoids. The thylakoids are a bunch of interconnected membrane bound stacks of flattened discs called grana, singular granum. 
So those flattened disks are going to be the focus of our conversations revolving around photosynthesis for the vast majority of this day. So the lamella connects those granulas together or those granas together. And ultimately we have those stacks as I have over here, oops, as we have here, those stacks of thylakoids are going to be where that photosynthesis like dependent reactions really happen. And I'll talk more about that coming up next. So that thylakoid, as I alluded to, it contains the, what's called chlorophyll as well as other pigments to capture that light energy. They also have ATP synthase enzymes. And when you think about why that's important, we'll talk about that as we move forward, but I want you to think about why that's important in order for that uh, chloroplast to function. So the space inside of the thylakoid membrane is called the thylakoid lumen. Again, that aqueous solution that it is, uh, it is surrounded by. So again, the common theme with regards to organelles and cells as a whole is that the, whatever structure that we are utilizing or talking about, it's always gonna have an aqueous solution surrounding it. Because again, it's very important to create those concentration gradients and you'll see when I talk about ATP synthase in the context of that thylakoid groups, because you really need to create that electrochemical gradient in some way, shape or form in order to, to harness that free energy correctly. And so it's a common, common theme with mitochondria and chloroplasts where that has to have some type of aqueous solution to do work within. So, how do plants capture that light energy? What is the key component of the light energy that it utilizes to go through photosynthesis? So the excitation of electrons, which is something I hope that some of you have learned in grade 11 chemistry if you took it. Again, it comes to up quite often in this course, but that's why I think it is so important for, for your understanding that I talk about it if you haven't learned it already. When photons, excite an electron, okay? They're gonna excite that electron and they're gonna move it to a higher energy state. So that electron absorbs a photon, which is a particle of light. And in that thylakoid membrane, it absorbs that photon, excites a single electron and moves it from that low energy state or that ground state to that high energy or excited state. This is very important. We've now harnessed in some way, shape or form that energy of the sun or a photon in an electron. And again, if you think about the parallels to aerobic respiration, electrons really help power that ATP synthase in terms of aerobic respiration. So now let's see what happens in photosynthesis. So once that electron is in that high energy or high excited state, there's gonna be three options for it within a pigment molecule. So the first option, oops, the first option is that that electron is going to release energy as heat and it will return to that ground state. That heat energy for all intents and purposes is pretty useless. However, it is still important to maintain temperature of plants and other organisms that go through photosynthesis. So that's the first option, releases that heat energy as it goes back to the ground state. Because again, that electron has harnessed that light energy, that photon, and in order to move back down to the ground state, it has to release that energy in some way, shape or form. The second way it does that is energy is released and excites an electron on another molecule. The electrons do not move, okay? Electrons do not move. I cannot stress how important that is in the context of photosynthesis relative to aerobic respiration. Electrons don't move in this part of the uh, light powered process or the light powered steps. But it does transfer that energy to another electron. And that is very important because now we're talking about movement of energy in some way, shape or form from electron to electron. Okay, so it goes back down to that ground state, releases that energy, but it's transferred to another electron. The last thing that it can do is that the electron moves to another molecule, okay? The another molecule. So in this case, unlike that previous example I talked about, we're moving an electron. We're moving an electron. It's gonna excite that primary electron acceptor. So as I said, with regards to the second step, where there's no electron movements and how it parallels 
to aerobic respiration, now we have electron movement, exciting a primary electron acceptor. So again, the parallels, the parallels of aerobic respiration to photosynthesis. In one context, there can be no electron movement, but in that other context, that potential electron can in fact move to another molecule. So again, when you're thinking about comparing and contrasting all of the processes of photosynthesis to aerobic respiration, recognize these three steps as a potential for that energy to be moved. So now we're gonna start talking about how those electrons in pigment are absorbed, or how the, elect the energy in the electrons kind of function within that molecule that they exist in. So we're gonna look at those pigment molecules. And two pigment molecules that are the major photosynthetic pigments are chlorophyll and carotenoids. So these two molecules are going to be responsible for the majority of the photosynthetic pigments that exist in plants and green algae. The, are, the most common are that chlorophylla. So when we think about the name of chlorophyll, when we think about how chlorophyll works and we think about the actual structure that we're referring to in plants, you, you really are thinking about the most common, which is that chlorophylla. So when we think about the molecules that are responsible for that photosynthetic process, uh, it's important to recognize the structure has a lot to do with how they function. So when you think about hydrocarbons as a whole, and when you think about where that energy is absorbed, in this case with regards to the carotenoid structure, it's alternating single and double bonds between carbons allow regions of that molecule to accept electrons. So it's going to accept that energy, it's going to accept that, those electrons that have that energy from the photon, and it will be used later in later processes. So it's very important to recognize the two structural differences. So in carotenoids, the alternating single double bonds between those carbons allow for that electron acceptance. With the chlorophyll structure, it has a very specific, specific molecule that is responsible for accepting electrons, which we're going to talk about as we move forward. Because when you think about how pigment molecules uh, exist within that thylakoid membrane, they're always going to be anchored. They're always going to be stuck in there. They don't specifically move per se, but they can allow for that movement of energy and electrons. We'll talk about the structural difference uh, for chlorophyll in, in just a second, because really and truly it's, it's quite different from those carotenoids. And, and we'll talk about why as we move through the process of photosynthesis, because it has some inorganic compounds that are, are kind of important for us to discuss. So the function of those pigments are probably one of the most paramount important aspects of photosynthesis and understanding how they accept energy, but they have to exist in structures that will facilitate the use of that molecule. So the antenna complex is embedded in that thylakoid membrane and it contains those light absorbing pigments that we discussed earlier. Some of these are going to transfer that energy uh, to special chlorophyll A molecules. And when those chlorophyll A molecules receive that electron or receive that energy, they're going to start to do some cool things with it. So the place that they do those cool things with it is at the reaction center. Now, it seems like a pretty self-explanatory name, but the reaction center is where all of those cool reactions will happen. So let's take a look at how that antenna complex transfers energy within that thylakoid membrane. So the first step, oh, the first step is that electron is received, okay? That electron is received from the sun and it's contained in one of those chlorophyll pigments that I, again, we'll talk more about how that works specifically. But then that energy is then transferred between pigment molecules. You'll see it bouncing around on each of those stacks, so to speak. And it's gonna bounce around, bounce around until it is transferred to that primary electron acceptor or that very specific pigment A molecule in that reaction center. So it, it bounces, it bounces, it bounces, it bounces, for lack of a better word, until it reaches its final destination of that reaction center where the vast majority of a very special pigment exists and it's gonna behave as that primary electron acceptor. So again, much like the aerobic or anaerobic, nope, aerobic respiration, 
it's going to have a primary electron acceptor at the end of a long chain of reactions. So when we think about chlorophyll A, and, and again, I talked about carotenoids not being that big of a deal, but they are a bit of an important structure. That chlorophyll A being the most important one is, is, is again, obviously very crucial as its concentration in that reaction center is highest and it behaves as that primary electron acceptor. But chlorophyll B as well as those carotenoids are gonna be called accessory pigments. Electrons in these pigments, they absorb light and they transfer that energy to chlorophyll A, uh, which is again, that primary acceptor in the reaction center. So when you think about the function of all of the different pigments, chlorophyll A being the most important one, B, carotenoids, and then the other ones which we talk about a bit later are gonna be those accessory pigments. So the reaction center is that, again, complex of proteins as well as pigments that are gonna have that primary electron acceptor of chlorophyll A. It's going to really, 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 really strongly attract electrons. And it will always become reduced during photosynthesis. Again, as a result of that high electronegativity, that high desire to be, to, to receive those electrons. Okay. And when I talk about energy and electrons, I'm going to talk about them synonymously, right? Because the energy is stored within the electrons. So that uh, for the process of photosynthesis, they're one and the same when I talk about energy and electrons. So how do those pigments do what they do? How are they going to take that electron and how are they going to harness the energy within that electron to create those sugars at a later date? So pigments are bound to proteins within that thylakoid membrane and they do not move freely. They do not move freely. The pigment proteins are organized into photosystems. Okay, and in these photosystems, it's gonna comprise of a couple of different structures. The first structure is a large antenna complex, which is gonna be responsible for that light harvesting complex of proteins that are approximately about 250 to 400 pigment molecules. So a very high concentration of those molecules. Again, those pigment molecules in that photosystem, they're gonna be really, really, really highly electronegative. So they're really going to attract a ton of electrons towards them and really want to be reduced because as they're reduced and as they take on those electrons, they also take on the energy that was stored in them as a result of that photon charging it. So that's the first stage or the first component of the photosystem. The second component is that central reaction center made up of a few proteins each bound to a pair of chlorophyll A molecules, as well as that primary electron acceptor where light energy is now gonna be converted into chemical energy. Okay, so in that first complex, that antenna complex, the light harvesting complex, where it's gonna really, 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 really wanna have as much pigment molecules as possible, that's gonna be that first aspect of the photosystem. The second region, that central reaction center, is where we're really gonna to start to look at converting that light energy to chemical energy. And it's going to use the carrier NADPH. Now you might be thinking to yourself, huh, plants use something, or animals use something similar to NADPH, NADH, but what are going to be the similarities and differences? I, we won't really go into too much details about that. Just recognize that they are so similar in the terms of what they actually do. Uh, as and function as electron carriers. Um, but again, the, the scope of this class doesn't go into the specific details about the subtle differences between them. So let's take a look at this structure of a photosystem, specifically as it pertains to how they work. So in my diagram off to the right, we look at that sunlight hitting that large antenna complex, right, within that chlorophyll or within that, that aspect of the chlorophyll that has all those pigments, okay? The electron's gonna bounce around until it reaches that reaction center where that light energy can now be utilized to convert into that chemical energy. All right. So how come light can work the way that it does with regards to plants? We've looked at the basic fundamentals of how that light energy can be absorbed and 
then it can then be utilized using NADPH to create that chemical energy. But how come light can behave in that way? How come it allows for that energy to be utilized? The, the most important aspect with regards to light is that we have to recognize that our grade 10 science will really help us out in this when we look at the wavelengths specifically because there's gonna be different energy as a result of different wavelengths, which we can kind of recall back from our grade 10 science that increasing energy with regards to the shorter wavelengths and decreasing energy with regards to the longer wavelengths. Now, visible light only happens within that small sliver towards the middle of that electromagnetic spectrum. So when we think about the shorter wavelengths and the greater energy of each photon of light, and then when we look at that visible light, that small range of wavelengths that humans are, are able to see, white light is that combination of all those colors, okay? Recall that those white lights are a combination of all those colors. Photosynthesis depends on the absorption of visible light by specific pigment molecules, which we've talked about. But they specifically like specific types of light. I said specifically a lot there, but that's okay. Pigments are those chemicals that produce visible colors by absorbing and reflecting different wavelengths of visible light. So the light that we see is the, one, is the light that's reflected. The absorbed light, which is the light that the plant uses, is not reflected. So for example, chlorophyll A reflects yellow and green light and absorbs red and blue wavelengths of light, making leaves appear to be a greenish color. Carotenoids reflect red and yellow wavelengths and absorb blue light, making leaves appear a reddish orange color for the most part. So it's interesting to think of the context of plants and how as a result of what pigments exist within their within their leaf structures, uh, how that changes the color that they become. So when you think about how leaves change colors, which I won't spoil too much about that because you can do a little activity about it afterwards, uh, it's important to recognize how the concentrations of the different pigments within that leaf really dictate the color that, that it, it shows. So we're gonna look at two types of spectrum and hopefully we can utilize this information to better do our assignment or to better understand our assignment. So when we look at the absorption spectra, the absorption spectra, it shows the relative absorption of different wavelengths of light. So it shows the absorption, right? Again, that absorption of different wavelengths of light. So when you look at that absorption spectrum up here and we say, okay, absorption of light percentage, it's absorbing, it's absorbing more the higher the graph reaches, okay? It doesn't really absorb any light color or wavelengths, I should say, or energy levels of light if the graph is smaller here. So there's no absorption really going on here, whereas at those peaks of some of those different pigments, there's way more light absorption going on, okay? So the absorption spectra or absorption spectrum, which it doesn't, yeah, don't worry too much about the specific details about spectra versus spectrum because we're, we're looking at it in terms of how much light, that relative absorption of different wavelengths of light. That's the more important thing to focus on. The second thing we can look at is that action spectrum. This shows the rate of photosynthesis at each wavelength of light. So in this graph, we show that the rate of O2 release in photosynthesis happens more happens at higher levels of that bluish purple light and that reddish orange light, and less so in this section, oops, less so in this section, which again, when you think about why leaves are the certain color that they are, this checks out in that context of which light energy they utilize and which light they absorb and what we see. So how are these two graphs related? What makes these two graphs related to each other? Well, the higher the ability to absorb the light, the more photosynthetic reactions will happen at that wavelength. Okay, folks, that's it for the lesson today. I'm going to stop recording and I will be answering any and all questions that have to do with the assignment, with to do with this lesson, and again, the reality of it is, is we're not going to go into too, too much detail of photosynthetic processes. 
uh, due to the uh, class itself, as well as some of the time constraints we have. We do talk a bit more about it later this afternoon. Uh, so when we get to that point, uh, we can talk about the specifics then. For now, I just wanted to give you a general overview of it all. Okay, folks, 